Hi, today we are discussing Langsmith, a new platform developed by the makers of Langchain. Langsmith is designed to aid in the debugging, testing and monitoring of LLM applications, bridging the gap between prototypes and production. Throughout this video, we'll dive into its core functionalities, explore its offerings and understand its implications for those who work with LLM systems. You can find the code in the description, but you need a Langsmith account to make it work. Currently, it's still in closed beta, but you can apply for an account. So this is the Langsmith UI. You can visit it at smith.langchain.com. Here you can create and manage projects and you can also create and manage your datasets for testing and evaluation. You can already do a lot of stuff in the UI, but of course, normally it makes more sense to use code. So we will only create a new project and retrieve a new API key. So let's first create a new project, give it a name. I just call it my project. The default name for a project is just default. So we're gonna change that. We can also create a new data set, but we will also do that with code. So let's submit this. And there you can see there's a little introduction what you can do. So you can use Python or TypeScript. We will use Python. So we have to install Langchain and also export some environment variables. And then this is the most basic example, just run a normal LLM. And this will be already tracked if the environment variables are set up correctly. So as you can see, we need an API key. To retrieve that API key, we have to go here where the key symbol is and then just create a new API key. Copy that API key and then go to VS Code and now save that API key here in the .n file. Just enter it here like this. And as you can see, the other values are length chain tracing v2 set to true and then the length chain endpoint. This is the only endpoint currently available, I think. But hopefully in the future, we will be able to set up our own endpoints for tracking because LLM calls can of course contain sensitive information and we don't want to know the Langchain creators everything about our LLM systems. Then we've got also our project name. This is the name of the project we just created in the UI and then an OpenAI API key. So if that is set up correctly, we can now go to the length IPython notebook and just walk through the code here. So to make this project work, we have to install some packages, Langsmith, Langchain, OpenAI, and python.env. So if we run that in the Jupyter notebook, it is installed. And then let's load with load.env the environment variables we defined here in the .env file. Okay, so after loading that, we can now run our first chain. If you run that, we will receive an output from OpenAI. As in AI, I don't have feelings. Okay, that worked fine. But if you go in the UI now, we can see that if you go to the projects and then in my project, then we can see in all runs that we've got our first run in the UI. So the input was, how are you? and we can also see the output. We can see the start time, we can see the latency, we can see the used tokens. So we can see the status as well. So the most important information about our LLM run is now saved permanently in this UI. Okay, that works on a global level because we set the correct environment variables. But if we want more control, we can also use the Langsmith and Langchain libraries uh, here to get more control. So from Langchain, we import the Langchain tracer class and then we create a tracer instance with the project name. For example, this can now be my project or we call it maybe second project. And now we can run a prediction again with how many people live in USA and we pass in the tracer now as callback to the LLM call. If we run that, we can see everything worked as expected. And now let's go to projects and we can see we created a second project and we can see here is another call. So this is how we can handle this project here with code. Okay, this can be done a little bit differently too with a context manager. So let's have a look at this. So we can import tracing v2 enabled from langchain.callbacks. And now with tracing v2 enabled, we can pass here a project name. So again, let's use the my third project and now run the same question again. So the difference here, you don't have to create an instance here of the Langchain Tracer, but it works the same. Let's check that out in a project as well. 
go to projects and here we can see third project and also another LLM call. Okay, let's get back to VS Code. And now we want to have a look at tagging LLM calls. Why do we want to use a tag? So there are two reasons. One is to actually filter different LLM calls and then not just filter the whole LLM call, but you can also filter for sub tags. So a chain normally consists of different steps and you can tag each of the steps and then have a look at different steps and filter the different steps. In this example here, we provide a tag for the creation of the chat model. And then we also provide a tag for creating the LLM chain. And then a third step is to actually call the chain. And there we provide a shared tag. So if you run that, then we go to our project again. This is of course the default project now. So in my project, we will have another LLM call. To be exact, we have got a run type of chain because we use the LLM chain class. And here we can see our tags now, one tag and the shared tags. So we can now filter for one tag. And if we enter that, we see only the runs which contain the tag one tag. We can also drill down here, just click on that. And here you can see this is the LLM chain itself. And this is the creation of the chat OpenAI class. So this is the LLM creation and this is the chain creation. So we can see different steps with different tags for our LLM calls. We can also group different LLM calls. This can be done with the trace as chain group function here from langchain.callbacks.manager. So this works like this with a context manager. We pass in our group name and then we run our LLM calls. So in a real world example, we create our LLM and then our prompt template and we now run different chains and these are grouped now here uh, with the callback as group manager. So let's try that out. Let's run that and then we have a look at the UI. This will take a little bit longer because there are multiple runs. Let's have a look at the UI. Again, go to my project in the UI, we can click on this little icon now, and here we can see there are our group calls. This is another way of structuring your LLM calls besides using tags. So currently we've only been in the UI, but you can also use code to actually list your calls. So we import from length myth the client class, we instantiate that, this will use the correct environment variables if you set up everything correctly. And then we just run the list runs method, pass in the project name and the project name can be default. Of course, we don't have the default name, but we will take a look at the runs at my project. So let's run this. And as you can see, this returns a generator. So we can loop over this generator now. We can also uh, define the start time and then the run type, as you can see, the run type was, for example, here was a, a chain and this was LLM. So we can filter it with a start time and we can also uh, filter it by the run type itself. So this will again return a generator and we can loop over this generator and just print our runs. As you can see, these are our runs. So each run has got a unique ID, a name, start time and a lot of more information. So take a look at that if you're interested. Another way to filter runs is not just the start time and run type, but we provided some metadata. And for example, if you run a chain that provides that kind of metadata, we can also later filter by that metadata. So we do it like this. We list the client runs and then we filter by has metadata. And then we pass in this information, which we provided here as dictionary and filter by that. And at the end, you can see we've got our run with a single ID here. Okay, that was the tracing part of the video. Now let's have a look at the data and evaluation part of this video. So again, we will load the environment variables here. And first we will create a data set. So this is a simple list of, a, of tuples. So this will be the question and this will be the answer. And we want to use that data set to evaluate the quality of an LLM. So first we create a new client, then we create a dataset name. And from the client, we use the create dataset method, we pass in the dataset name, and we pass in a description. So this is now the dataset. To upload that to LangSmith, we can 
use the create example method and we loop over the list of tuples here. And this is tuple index zero and this is tuple index one. And we provide that as input for the create example method. So this is the question and this is the answer. So index zero and index one. If we run that, you can see this was pretty fast. We can now look here. So this is not in this part where the projects are, but here this is in data set and testing. We can now see elementary animal questions. And here we've got our inputs and here we've got our outputs. And we can see that these have not been used in a run yet. Of course, it's a quite uncommon way to store data in a tuple. So a more common scenario is that we've got a CSV file. So I provided you this CSV file. We've got question, answer, explanation, category and difficulty. So we can use this extended version now and also provide input keys, which is just question and then output keys. And instead of using create example, we can now upload CSV. So this will make use of our CSV file. The CSV file is called extendedquestions.csv is in the same directory as the iPath notebook. And now we can give it a name. We can also provide the description. So that's already finished now. Let's have a look at the data. And we can see we've got a second data set, my extended CSV data set. Example count is four again. And this looks a little bit different now because now first we've only got a string in inputs and as answer we've got this kind of JSON object now. And again, this was not used in a run yet. So now we've got our data sets and we didn't save the data sets just for the purpose of saving data sets, but we want to evaluate our LLMs now. So let's try that. And to evaluate our LLMs, we can import the run eval config from Langsmith and also import run on data set. This is the method here we have to use for evaluating our data set. So we instantiate this run eval config with a list of evaluators and these are predefined strings. I will explain that a little bit later because there are actually classes behind that which make a little bit more sense than just the strings. So this is for just normal question answering. This is for question answering with context and this is actually the same. But again, I will take a look at the interface with you a little bit later. So first, let's create our client. Then we will just call the run on dataset method. So this is very important because this contains the information from the environment variables and we pass it here as client and then we pass the dataset name elementary animal questions for so the first dataset we created and there we have to provide an LLM or a chain factory. So we just use chat open AI for this and for the evaluation we use this evaluation config with, which is an instance of the run eval config class. So let's run this. This takes a little bit longer now. So it's finished and we even get provided a link with an URL. So we just click on that. And here we can see this is the result of our evaluation. We can see the correctness was checked and we get a 1.00, so everything was correct. We can see the latency and we can also see the AI output our model created. So here on the top, we can see the correctness and also the contextual accuracy. So everything works fine. But here on the left, we can see that we used quite an amount of tokens, 800 for four examples. So let's imagine we've got a larger example we want to evaluate on, then it might probably not the best solution to do that with an OpenAI model, but rather with a private model. Because normally the evaluation does not need such a good model like GPT-4, for example. Okay, now let's have a look at a more verbose version of what we just did. So normally we want to create um, a custom prompt template. Here we can see we've got a query, we've got an answer and the result from the prediction. Currently we only have only correct and incorrect. We can use more categories if we want to. And we can now use this prompt template and pass it here in the uh, run eval config. So we use that prompt here in the first prompt and these evaluators actually are the same as before, but now we use classes instead of strings. So we've got QA here, context QA and cot QA. So these match the same as before. So this is the QA class, context QA and cot QA class. But actually if we take a look at this, we can see that this 
Q&A class, takes this evaluator type, so the evaluator type is Q&A, and then the LLM is none as default and the prompt is also none as default. What's quite interesting, because I took that from the documentation, is that context QA and cod QA is actually the same. It uses the same evaluation type. And yeah, I don't see any difference here, but yeah, maybe that will change in the future. And that's just a little bug in the docs. So let's run that again. And now we have to run that on the dataset again. We use the client and we use the same dataset name. Okay, it's finished. Now we can see, we can visit another URL. And here we can see, this is now our output from the LLM calls. Let's try to refresh it. And here, now we get our information, correctness, contextual AI. This was not updated in the UI completely yet. So let's wait a little bit longer currently. It seems to be a little bit slow. I don't think that um, has to do anything with the classes, but just my connection or just the OpenAI uh, web API. Okay, now it's completely finished. We can see again, we see the overall feedback. We see the latency, which was quite slow, but yeah, that happens. And again, the total use of tokens. So that's it. If many of you are interested in this video, I might do a follow-up video with a larger project and Llama or some other open source alternative model for evaluation. If you like this video, give the video a thumb up and subscribe to my channel, of course. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.